So uh, speaking of rock stars, I think we're about to get started. We'd like to bring on Mitch Johnson, who is the host and uh, uh, um, chair, if you will, of the events that we're having this morning, uh, partnering with Secretary um, Murphy. And uh, I've known um, Mitch Johnson for a long time. Uh, he won't admit it, but I have. And uh, actually, I've got a little bio here. Do yeah, you please give I the bio on okay. him. He's a great well, friend. He, he, he leads the way. The federal service is practiced for Curtis Process Consulting, CPC, who enables clients to combine operational excellence with big data analytics. Yeah. Boy, there's a big word, huh? For extracting the hidden insights and process intelligence needed to create value and to achieve organizational success. So hello, hello, and thank you. Thank you, Mitch Johnson, for sure. Fantastic. And been a big uh, uh, part of our executive steering committee. So good morning, Mitch. How are you today, sir? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, sir, but maybe, uh, oh, I think you might even be muted. I don't know. How about that? Is that better? Yes, sir. Good to All hear right. you. Thank you, David. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. How uh, are you? Great to have you on. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate that <clears throat> kind introduction. It's uh, my, my pleasure to be here on this chilly, damp morning in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, let me extend a good morning and welcome to everyone else that's uh, that's joining us. Um, do I have Rich Jarvis with me? I am here. Hey, good morning, Rich. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Mitch. I'll tell you what, Mitch, let me jump in here. We want to uh, let the world know who, uh, who Dr. Rich Jarvis is all about. He's the CEO of Blueprints Lab, developing innovation project management platforms that Take ideas to market, and he uh, has more than 20 years' experience as a scientist, an inventor, entrepreneur, holds several patents, and is the recipient of two Life Science Product of the Year awards. So, Dr. Rich Jarvis, say hello to Mitch Johnson, who are our two, uh, two leaders today here in the first part of our program. Delighted to have you both here. Yeah, thank you. Great, great. Well, Rich, it's great to see you, um, and, and as Scott was mentioning, you guys at Blueprints Lab are doing some really fantastic work. And I'm sure you're gonna share a few uh, nuggets with us here in a few minutes. Uh, welcome to today's Defense Innovation Summit. Hey, you know, Rich, with all the, uh, the big names, the big name players and the headliners that, that are coming up shortly, it's kind of neat that uh, guys like you and I get to help kick the day off. Um, you know, some of the folks tuning in might might say, so how do a couple of guys from the smaller side of the, the defense industrial supply base uh, get a chance like this? And uh, that being, you know, me from a boutique management consulting firm and you from a, an innovation accelerator. You know, I think, <clears throat> I think the chance that we have here really underscores uh, an important theme of today. And that is uh, to advance technologies for national security and to do it most effectively requires you know, more active participation, uh, broader collaboration, and smart partnerships uh, to do it right. And uh, that theme will be reinforced, actually both, advancing technologies for national security and partnerships uh, and collaboration will be a key theme resonating throughout the day. So, uh, Rich, um, during the bio, I heard Scott mention things like, you know, taking ideas to market and accelerating the, the technology commercialization process. I'm sure folks tuning in like to hear a little bit more about, you know, the cool and cutting edge things that Blueprints Labs is doing uh, these days to make a difference. So if you would, you know, share for next five, six minutes, tell us some of the things going on at Blueprints Labs. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mitch. Um... Well, you know, we, we got our, our, our you know, birth, birth out of uh, a university setting. So, um, you know, what, I, what I'd like to maybe focus on today, you know, is what that looks like. You know, what does collaboration look like uh, within the university setting? And collaboration, you know, that, that could bring uh, technology to market. And so for over the, I don't know, the last two years, really it's been, a, it's been almost five or six years, but over the last two years, we've had a you know, Blueprints had a real concerted effort uh, in uh, working in collaboration with Baylor University uh, in Waco, Texas, and uh, and a local uh, VC firm uh, called Waco Ventures uh, to you know tackle sort of the well-known problem that over ninety percent of university technology never finds its way to the marketplace. You know, it's it's nearly ninety-five percent. So most of that technology is just. Uh, gets developed, it, it gets patented, and it sits, you know, in folders at a university, just never taken out. And, you know, there's uh, just droves of 
tremendous uh, amounts of intellectual property uh, that could be taken out. But historically, it's difficult, right, to work with universities. It's uh, it's a challenge, you know, from a, a number of different levels. Uh, often the IP isn't as high quality as needed. Um, you know, it, it, the, the university could be slow to, uh, you know, develop uh, prototypes and 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 so forth. So it's 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 a challenge. And so we we stepped in as a as a as a as a company and said, hey, let's work together. Um, and so what we did is we established uh, a lab to market collaborative. We call it L2M, and uh, essentially, you know, retooled the tech transfer system. You know, the tech transfer office at Baylor. And, and you know, in our in our new world, the collaborative, uh, you know, the university is no longer responsible for commercialization. So we kind of say, hey, you're the inventor. We'll come in and and uh, you know, you disclose the invention. It's our role to uncover the economic value and you know, drive the, you know, patent and, uh, and the prototype process. So that comes into our court. So they invent, we help them uh, get sponsored research and drive, uh, you know, things their way so they can continue to invent. And our job is to, to uh, you know, develop a process to take them to market. So that's what we did. We, we put a method together uh, and we, it has the acronym uh, SIMPLE, S-I-M-P-L. Um, but the goal is to reduce risk, you know, as we move, move these inventions, you know, along a real disciplined uh, pathway to become prototypes by integrating, uh, you know, data early on to inform things like IP strategy, uh, technology planning processes, and, and um, you know, we bring in uh, subject matter experts. We utilize, you know, kind of like you, data analytics, right? The goal is to get big data, understand how to uh, bring context around intellectual property, bring context around the, uh, the technology. So when we go to market, um, uh, it, it's not going with, you know, kind of from a vacuum. Universities are often patenting within a vacuum. Uh, they don't look at the marketplace. They just put a patent in place and hope it sticks, you know, down the line. And so we kind of changed that process and said, hey, you know, let's, let's act more like a small, small company that uh, is aggressive where um, we're going to understand the, the, uh, the market before we patent, understand that, you know, build a product uh, scenario before we patent, and that's unusual. That's a little different. So we had to, we had to, you know, shake some things up. Um, but um, you know, it, it's it. You know, our process also speeds things along. And our goal was to remove some of the stops, remove some of the bottlenecks, um, and again, find that market pull before we 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 do anything. So um, you know, sometimes our process makes it real clear that the technology needs to be dropped. Right? It's just you know, so so many technologies. Uh, or, or you know, IP uh, uh, you know that universities create really just need to stop and not not proceed. It's not going to make it in the marketplace, and that's a tough call. But if the university doesn't have data, they can't make a data driven decision, and so they just continue to patent. So we provide that information for them, um, and then we went ahead and you know put all of this you know this method I you know we've developed on on a SaaS platform, uh, so the process could be really efficient and tracked and. Uh, measured and presented, reported, and we could show metrics and 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 so forth uh, to the university and and you know the the executives there. Um, so so far, you know the process, uh, the collaborative process, university blueprints and a VC um, taking on different roles and responsibilities, been working. We launched two technology startups this past year. We we're able to raise uh, you know over seventeen million dollars in pre revenue investment. Uh, and this is early tech, very early stuff, um, but we have the data to, uh, to show the, the investors. So we create data rooms as we build this story, if you will, from an idea to market. We create uh, you know, uh, these, these data rooms where they can go and, and, and look at the information. So validated technologies, validated uh, you know, concepts. Um, and uh, so, so you know, we've been real, real pleased. And another area that, um, maybe I can, I can talk about a little bit too is related to collaboration uh, is uh, we're finding some, some you know, interesting traction with respect to bringing multiple uh, stakeholders together uh, to develop single technologies at Baylor. Um, you, know, you know, one technology from many. And so, you know, where let's say three or more startups come together, uh, you know, businesses, and sometimes even, uh, you know, trusted government contractors come together to build a technology. This has been taking place for about a year and a half at Baylor. Um, 
you know, the goal is to get the best of the best technologies, you know, and, and uh, you know, to build the best possible solutions. And sometimes that requires, you know, integrating, right, multiple technologies. And, uh, and, and, and now we have, um, you know, a number of these, you know, actually working, you know, up and working now. And um, so, so that's, that's something that uh, we're real proud of and something that uh, we're excited where we really believe that the, the university could be that collaboratory, if you will, that collaboratory mm -hmm. environment that facilitates that process where, you know, if you have multiple companies coming together and there's a single tech that has a capability that say, let's say the military wants, the university, you know, has the researchers to be the glue, to do the research, to glue, if you will, parts together. And that's what's, that's what's uh, really exciting and, and taking, you know, place at Baylor. So, uh, you know, we focus on areas that Baylor has expertise and, and uh, you know, so we kind of call it like the university is the connective tissue, right, that, uh, you know, hosts, you know, that environment. Um, so that's been, that's been something new and it's, and it's exciting and I can provide you with some Examples, we had more time, but, um, you know, I think, you know, Baylor's got a number of techs going to the Army, going to the Air Force now. Um, for instance, best, best hardware, best software, best monitoring capabilities, say, for, you know, command control, uh, you know, communications. So, anyways, that's just, that's just some highlights of, you know, things we're doing and in a collaborative way. Well, great. Well, well Rich, thank you for sharing that with us. You, uh, you covered a lot of ground there. Um, let, let me just say it's been a pleasure uh, over the past several months getting to know you and uh, your team at Blueprints in particular, Dr. Greg Lehman and, and Casey Lehman. I, I think you know, I'm, I'm quite certain that my first introduction to uh, Blueprints Lab was at the last Defense Innovation Summit in March uh, here in Dallas. Um, you know, so, you know, I think um, kind of playing off of what I heard you say there, you know, it's about taking technology and transforming it into capabilities and applications that could be put into play, uh, you know, in use cases, uh, you know, moving the ball downfield faster, more reliably, more inexpensively, um, you know, and that's a key theme of these morning panels that we have about to, to launch uh, is advancing technologies for national security and for economic prosperity. And I think there's Kind of back to that partnerships and collaboration there's an opportunity for many of us within the defense industrial supply base to contribute uh and to prosper you know at the same time so um you know with that you know i think rich um we have a another guest we'd like to introduce here in, in a moment and uh this gentleman has the the honor and the privilege of of introducing our, our morning keynote speaker. So uh, if you if you would, uh, perhaps you would can introduce us now to our to our what our actually our title sponsor representative, uh, Jason Koloski. Jason, are you with us? I am indeed. Good, good morning. Good morning. Sorry about that. We're working with technology here. <laughs> well, it, it, it's great. It's great to have you. Um, you know, Jason, I know you've got some things you'd love to share with us uh, leading up to uh, the introduction of our keynote speaker. Um, I understand that you're part of the business development and strategy uh, area of Raytheon Intelligence and Space. So, so, Mitch, I, I, I must apologize. I'm I'm just logging on here. I had a I, I had you on mute. If you could, um, if you, you could... Re replay that for you. Yeah, that'd be really good. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Well, no, we uh, welcome and, and we're we're so thankful to have you and to have uh, Raytheon Technologies as our our title sponsor uh, for all three events that are that are occurring. This being the third of three in the month of October for the America's Future series. Um, we're excited to have you introduce our, <clears throat> our keynote speaker here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but as I said, I understand that you're uh, with Raytheon Intelligence and Space and, and, and you come from their business development strategy area. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little more about your role within Raytheon. Yeah, so we're, we're, uh, we're leading in a pretty exciting time in, in the uh, 
the company's um, history right now. We just went through a, a pretty substantial merger that's placed Raytheon Technologies as the, the second largest defense um, uh, contractor in the world. And uh, in particular, what we're focused on with, um, with our business area is a number of ISR platforms um biz, business jet type solutions um we have a range of uh pretty innovative um various mts uh potted platforms that we support both the navy and the air force on and it's just it's a, it's a fascinating time to be leading this business so I'm, I'm i'm glad to be on and uh it looks like uh the general just joined us so i'm going to kick it back over to you all well, thank you for that, Jason. Um, I, I think we're actually a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. Is, is there anything else that you uh, would like to share with us about uh, what you see in the near term for, for Raytheon Technologies? You did mention uh, the recent merger. Uh, that, just, that doesn't happen every day, so I'm sure there's a bit of <laughs> integration and a little assimilation going on there. Yeah, so you know it's 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 an interesting time. Uh, we've both gone through uh, a massive merger um, while dealing with the the effects of COVID. So we're trying to bring um, essentially three or four different companies together, uh, different business areas, if you will, uh, all virtually, uh, which has its uh, which has its challenges. And at the same time, uh, look to the future where you know the. Um, we've gone through some pretty significant changes in the global environment, whether that's shifting from a focus on the global war on terrorism to now near peer or peer threats um, and making the investments that um, go along with that has been a, uh, it's been a pretty sporty, uh, pretty sporty ride, but you know, we're looking, we're looking for innovative solutions from a host of uh, smaller businesses that can, uh, can bring forth that are nimble and, um, that's, uh, that's one of our major focuses right now, seeing what's out there, bringing it in, into the, the Raytheon Technologies new family and then pushing out to the, the warfighter. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that, uh, Jason. <clears throat> I think we're, we're about at that point. Um, and I, I know it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege, as I mentioned earlier, to, for you to have this opportunity to introduce our, our keynote speaker for the morning. So if you would, uh, please take that, take it, and let's let's introduce our, our next speaker. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I greatly appreciate the handoff, Mitch. Um, my name is Jason Koloski, and I am the uh, business development and strategy executive for Raytheon's intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance business. Um, welcome to the Defense Innovation Summit on Advanced Technology and National Security. It is indeed my honor to introduce our keynote speaker today, General Mike Murray. Uh, the commanding general of the Army's Future Command. Over his 38-year military career, General Murray has served in a number of leadership roles, including the Director of Force Management at the Pentagon and the Deputy Director for Joint Training at the, joint, um, at the J-7 on the Joint Staff. He's held numerous command assignments, including Commanding General Joint Task Force Three, Deputy Commanding General of U.S. Forces in Afghanistan, and the Commanding General at Bagram Airfield. He was selected as the very first commanding general to lead the Army's Future Command. Its mission is to modernize the processes and integrate innovative technologies to enhance the Army's capabilities. He's really the brains and the driver of the Army's modernization priorities to help the service reimagine its entire approach to leading and dominating future battle space. One of the top, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the Army's top efforts includes future vertical lift which will revamp its entire fleet of reconnaissance, attack, and assault aircraft with advanced capabilities so that our service members are ready, to, are ready for combat across all domains. General Murray has been at the forefront of these ambitious efforts to advance the Army into the 21st century, working hand-in-hand -hand with industry to understand the art of the possible so that our military can outpace threats of tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming General Mike Murray. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate that. And I assume you can hear me okay. If you can just give me a thumbs up or let me know. All right, great. So thanks for the introduction and, and thanks, 
to America's Future Series for allowing me to, to speak today. And, you know, I, I looked at the participants, um, a lot of folks that I, that I know and have worked with, Harry Radigi, um, was actually a neighbor in Colorado Springs when I was a captain a really long time ago. Uh, Mr. Gertz, Hondo Gertz, uh, uh, cohort in crime, I guess. Gordon England, I actually spent some time with Gordon. Uh, I guess it's been about 18 months ago, and we talked about exactly the types of things that we're going to talk about today. And then you got some great panelists from the Army in terms of Neil Thoroughgood, Lieutenant General Thoroughgood, the uh, RICTO director, uh, Ross Kaufman, Next Gen Combat Vehicle, CFT director, and, and Len Rosenoff, who runs Army Applications Lab for me. And I, I think I've got 20 minutes, maybe 30, and I could probably take all that and a lot more just because there has been so much that has happened in the last two years since we set up Army Futures Command. And a lot of you remember two years ago, uh, we were talking about a, a startup trying to manage a merger. We were talking about the biggest reorganizational change since 1973. And, you know, you, you often get lost in, in when you're part of it. Uh, but as I look back over the last two years, I mean, just incredible progress. And, and we've built an incredible team. And you're going to hear about some of that today. Um, and once again, thanks to American Future Series. The, the one thing that I found out, these are always hard events to pull off. And virtual really doesn't make it much easier. And hopefully at some point, uh, we'll get to the, a point in the future where we can do these live again. And because what I really miss is the opportunity to talk to everybody and the interaction that always goes along with this. Um, so today I'm going to talk, uh, like I said, for about 20 or 30 minutes. And so you can kind of uh, follow along with what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to frame it around four things. And those four things were what the Army asked Army Futures Command to do when they stood it up. Uh, about a little over two years ago, so exactly August of uh, 2018. And those four things were uh, begin to describe, and I use the word describe intentionally, and I don't use define, a future operational environment was number one. Number two was develop the concepts the Army will need to operate in that future operational environment. Number three would be based upon those concepts in that operational environment, begin to uh, lay out how the Army will need to reorganize itself to execute that concept in that environment. And finally, and last but not least, support the delivery of material. And I say support delivery because AFC does not and cannot deliver material on its own. On its own. So it's our great ASOL partners to include all the great PMs and PEOs uh, that are all belong to ASOL that will help support, that we will help support in the delivery of that material. And then I'll talk about one emerging responsibility. Um, and we're in the throes right now of figuring out exactly what that looks like. And that is to find, acquire, and probably most importantly, retain the talent we're going to need into the future. And to be totally realistic and honest with you, it's the talent we need today as we speak. And we are behind uh, in not having that talent, but really recognizing that talent and figuring out how we harness the power and then retain those, those great young soldiers and civilians to have that talent. But before we get into all that, I, I would like to take just a minute to talk about uh, an AFC organization uh, that most of you probably don't even know belongs to Army Futures Command, and it doesn't get nearly enough credit, and that would be the Medical Research and Development Command located at Fort Detrick. Um, we're doing this virtual because of a global pandemic, and I would just tell you back in March, uh, MRDC, Medical Research and Development Command, got the task to lead the Army's effort in response to COVID-19. Uh, led by Brigadier General Mike Talley, and Mike has done a phenomenal job. Uh, MRDC has been at the forefront of not only the Army's response uh, from the very, very beginning, but in many ways, the nation's response. So a lot of members uh, from MRDC belong to Operation Warp Speed. You know uh, General Gus Perna is the lead military face on that, but between the doctors, scientists, uh, acquisition specialists, both civilian and uniform, a large portion of Operation Warp Speed comes from MRDC. Three primary lines of effort 
from the very, very beginning for MRDC, number one being TREAT. Uh, so we were an early adopter of remdesivir based upon MRDC's work. Uh, we've actually been using remdesivir successfully in medical in military medical treatment facilities for probably about the last six months. And then also an early adopter of convalescent plasma. Testing early efforts to expand the capacity. Uh, so instead of getting 10 results an hour, getting 1,000 results an hour through the various uh, tests, capabilities we had. And then most recently, um, a lot of uh, CRADAs and a cooperative agreements with both industry and academia to print 3D print uh, swabs, uh, the swabs we all love so much, up to the point where we're now capable of producing in the tens of thousands a day of 3D printed swabs. And then from the prevent uh, line of effort, vaccine development, um, we, have, we began work on a vaccine very early on, and it's exceptionally promising. We're in phase one clinical trials right now. Two good things about this vaccine. It's one, not two shots, and we think. And it also, uh, it's all about the carrier, th those of you that know the vaccine, uh, the platform, if you will, that we think this is a platform that could be used for future iterations of a vaccine. Because just like the flu, we believe that this will mutate over time, and it's going to be a uh, basically a different vaccine every year. And as I mentioned, large role in Operation Warp Speed. So I want to get that out of the way and just uh, give Mike Talley and MRDC uh, a tip of my hat and just tell them how incredibly proud we are of them and their work with COVID. Okay, so future operational environment, the, the first piece. And the thing I normally tell everybody when you talk about a future operational environment is number one, you got to define the future. So when I say future, uh, we are focused primarily uh, 35 and out. So let's just call it 35 to, to 50. Um, and I could say 35 to 49 because those of you that uh, read history or not history, but lead, uh, read public policy of one of our near peers, um, 49 is a pretty important year for one of them. Um, and so we're, we're focused, what some people would say is a long time in the future, 35 to, to 50. I would tell you 35 will be here before you know it. Uh, we're in now FY21, so we're talking 14 years from now. And I think back over my 38 year career, and it seems like it went by in the blink of an eye. Uh, so 14 years will be here very, very quickly as we begin to describe, not define, because the other key part is you will absolutely be wrong. And if you don't admit that up front, I'll guarantee you you're going to end up in the wrong spot. So we know our description of the future is going to be wrong. And it's broad enough that it is an azimuth. It's not necessarily a destination as we continue to, to watch as we get closer to that future uh, to make adjustments to some of the assumptions that we've made. Uh, so describing that future, understanding you're going to be wrong. And the reason that's important is that has to drive our S&T investments. When we start to make investments in basic and applied research, we're easily 10 to 14 years into the future. So if we don't understand where we want to be fundamentally or where we need to be fundamentally in the future, we'll make some really bad S&T investments. We'll get some of them right, uh, but we won't be as right as we could be about where we're investing our S&T. And so we're in the process right now of that's in staffing internal to the Army, our description of that future operational environment. And then about as soon as it gets approved, we're going to change it because it's a constant look. It's a constant adjustment. It's looking at near peer and really worldwide S&T investments uh, from a military perspective to include dual use technologies. It's about really watching where our near peers are going and where we think they're going to be. So it is a description. We understand we're going to be wrong. We understand we're going to have to adjust it almost constantly. And it includes organizations like Mad Scientists, which is a really interesting group. Uh, we're beginning to reach out to academia and bring in academia. And we've reached out to some of the, the country's leading futurists to help us understand where we could be. Once you have begun to describe that future operational environment, it should drive where you're going in concepts. Most of you probably know multi-domain operations is our current concept. We're in the process of, of transitioning 
and we will transition this over the fall and early winter to an organization called the Combined Arms Center or CAC, which is a part of Training and Doctrine Command. And CAC is really responsible for the doctrine of the United States Army. Uh, it will take us months to transition it, and it will take them years to transition a concept into doctrine. Um, Jim Rainey leads CAC, uh, worked with Jim Rainey for probably the last 20 years. Um, and I've got all the confidence in the world that we're on the right path to transition multi-domain operations into, into doctrine. And what that really allows us to do is to begin the future on what comes next. Is it another version of multi-domain operations? Is it something totally different than multi-domain operations? And really, um, Steph Ahern just recently joined us, Colonel Steph Ahern out of the Secretary's office. She's my director of concepts. She's been with us about two months now. Um, and really what I've had her focused on is get out to see a thing called Project Convergence, which I'm going to get to here in just a minute, and begin to understand because Project Convergence, the one thing I'll say up front, was much more than technology. Technology is what everybody kind of likes to talk about, and it was absolutely a key part of it. But Convergence was, Project Convergence was about, was as much about how we're going to need to fundamentally fight different in the future and how we're going to fundamentally need to organize different in the future. So Steph spent a lot of time on the ground looking at the technology and that intersection, if you will, between concepts and technology, which I think is a underexplored and underutilized concept is really, could, in my mind, they go hand in hand. How, how do new technologies drive future concepts. And when you get concept writers saying, if only I could, you know, technologist says, actually, you can't do that today, but 10 years from now, that, that, that technology will be mature enough, we can transition it into a program of record. You get some really powerful interactions between two communities that really have never interacted in the past, not formally anyway. That formal linkage, by the way, is what we call uh, Team Ignite. Um, and that was really, from the very beginning, my understanding that we need to tie two communities together. Those would be the technologists and the scientists and the concept developers. So anyway, my task to Steph Ahern was get out the project convergence, and I want you to look at really five things. I call them the big three plus two, uh, because if, if you're a historian and you go back in history, uh, the interwar periods, you know, every every country in the world, uh, every major country in the world developed and had armored vehicles. They developed and had uh, radios and they developed and had airplanes, all for military use. At the beginning of World War II, it, everybody had those technologies. The Germans figured out a different way of combining those three technologies. And it, it gave them a significant if not tactical, then operational advantage at the beginning of World War II until everybody else kind of caught up. I think those three technologies in a future scenario are artificial intelligence, autonomy, and robotics. And I say big three, those are the big three, and the plus two uh, would be if you're going to have those three and you're going to apply them in a military, militarily useful manner, you have to have a robust, reliable, resilient network and you have to have the data, data structures and the pipelines to move that data if you're going to make those three work. And that would be the plus two. So that's what I sent Steph out to Yuma uh, to spend some time on the ground and then begin to think about how those three big three plus two will not only change what we fight with, but change how we fight in the future. And that's the genesis of the next concept. A uh, series of white papers that we're working on right now, and it's really to begin to drive the thinking of not only the Army, uh, but our industry partners, academia, and really the, the, the big thinkers out there that can help us think our way through this. Um, project Convergence, uh, you know, it was about how we would fight, and, and to be honest with you, uh, this came late to me. Uh, it, it started with Ross Kaufman, who, and Ross is going to be on the net in one of the panels, and, and I'm sure he will go into great detail. Uh, General Ross Kaufman, who runs our next-gen combat vehicle cross-functional team, 
came to me probably about January with a concept of automated target recognition and sensor to shooter linkages uh, from a ground sensor to a ground vehicle. And in January or February, it just dawned on me that it's so much bigger than that, that we ought to be focused on sensor to shooter linkages across all the cross-functional teams. And so in Yuma, uh, really during the month of August and into mid-September, um, 120 degrees on the ground, uh, just phenomenal results as we brought five of the cross-functional teams out there and really began to focus on sensor to shooter linkages. Sensors from the ground, sensors from uh, vehicle platforms, sensors from air platforms and sensors from space and then a variety of different shooters up to and including a Marine Corps F-35B. And how do we begin to link sensors to not only shooters, but the right shooter through the right, through the necessary C2 node. If you remember the early dialogue, we started talking about all sensors, all shooters, all C2 nodes. And then you start thinking things about denied and degraded environments, which we will absolutely have uh, latency, bandwidth restrictions. And, and so we've matured a bit in saying sensors to the right shooter uh, through only the appropriate C2 node. And in some cases, I would say when there's no lethal decision involved, it may not be any C2 node. And so you're talking to machine to machine. And one of the things we learned is data becomes much more manageable when you're talking machine to machine because machines require different types of data. They don't require maps. They don't require overlays. They don't require full motion video. So your bandwidth restrictions become actually more manageable. So we were successful and I'm not going to steal Ross's thunder. I, I just ask you him to talk to a lot of details about project convergence. Um, we were successful in taking a process that at the National Training Center or the Joint Readiness Training Center uh, for a good unit takes, let's just say 10 minutes for a average unit is probably closer to 12 or 13 minutes. And that is see a target, pass the targeting data, and this is say pull a lanyard um, down to on the order of less than 30 seconds. And we did it over distance. So uh, we acquired from space to include commercial LEO, uh, to, include, to include government uh, mid-Earth orbiters and, and geosynchronous orbiters, pass that data to Joint Base Lewis McCord in, in Washington State, uh, ran it through an algorithm that we developed, so it's government owned, uh, did the automated target recognition, the mensuration of the target, passed a targeting message to TIDAT back down to Yuma through a command and control node uh, who merely just said, yes, I want that target serviced. That data went to a firing battery, and in this case, IRCA, and lanyard got pulled in some cases, low 20s, in most cases, about 30 seconds. Um, and so, that's important because when you look at that big three plus two and you look at a future battlefield, um, I fundamentally believe that the commander on the battlefield that can see first, understand first, decide first, and have the ability to act faster than any possible opponent we will ever face will have a significant advantage on a future battlefield. Um, and some people have equated that to FCS. I would prefer to equate that to John Boyd in the OODA loop which has been around for a long, long time. So that was, um, in a nutshell, convergence. Like I said, we could, we could talk about that probably the entire conference. Um, and as you know, we, we're expanding this to joint in 21. So the Army Air Force uh, Chiefs just recently signed an MOU, and I was part of that meeting uh, where we have agreed to bring their effort, ABMS, and our effort, uh, convergence together and solve joint problems uh, in, as we work our way into the future. And the Navy is also participating. The Marine Corps is, is excited to participate. And then in 22, we'll start to bring in coalition partners. Uh, at least initially, the Brits have signed up. And I just had a session with the Australians 
Army, and I think that they will also participate in 22. And the last thing I'll say about convergence is I don't see this as a demonstration and exercise. I see this as a learning opportunity. And that's the way we've we've approached it. So out of the 600 or so people we had on the ground, about 150 of those were data collectors. And we are pouring through terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data right now for an AAR that's coming up uh, in the next 20 days. So we can understand what it is that we thought we learned and whether we actually learned that or not. So we can develop the training objectives and the learning objectives for FY22, or excuse me, 21. Um, and then we'll do it all again in 22. Um, so that's a long way about concepts and then organizations. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to look at how we organize the multi-domain task force, which is an experimental unit right now, uh, stood up out at uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord as well, um, participated in the, in the recent PACOM U.S. Army Pacific exercises and got rave reviews from Admiral Davidson and the Indo-PACOM staff. Um, the bad news about this last project convergence is we had no operational units because we were late to need uh, forces command in terms of getting uh, their participation. In project convergence 21, we'll have the MDTF uh, because I really think a lot of the things we're working on are, are going to be applicable to what will most likely be a theater level asset. And then we're going to have a division headquarters and division TAC participating because I really think you start getting divisions and cores and at some point brigade combat teams involved that will really help drive our learning in terms of not only how we organize differently but how we fight differently in the future and then we'll also expand in pc21 and bring two additional cross-functional teams the synthetic training environment and the soldier lethality uh, CFT into it as well, as, as well as MRDC, um, the medical folks, where we'll try out a, a new hoist. Um, and then, you know, really what I'm talking about is just an extension of what we call soldier-centered design. So getting soldiers involved that will be responsible for fighting these organi organizations, providing us input on how they see these, these organizations looking and how they see them fighting in the future. And then lastly, I told you the fourth pillar was supporting the delivery of material. And, and like I said, partnered with some great PEOs and PMs, all, all run by ASALT. Um, and the thing I'd highlight there is, and, it, and I'm talking about the, the 31 signature systems plus the RICTO systems, uh, three and some people say four, but lots of uh, really great material. But the thing I like to highlight more than that is a different approach. And so um, later this afternoon, I'm going to get a plane and fly up to Fort Pickett, where we're doing uh, Soldier Touch Point 3 for a system called the Integrated Visual Augmentation System. Great capability, rapid delivery, about four years from a, con a gaming concept uh, to a, a militarily fieldable piece of hardware, uh, the ability in, in, in just basic terms, it's a heads up display for a ground soldier uh, to include 3D terrain, to include mapping data, to include uh, rehearsals on the 3D terrain, to include an after action review of all the action soldiers took, to include health monitoring for leaders of their soldiers, to include a weapon site that will go on a next gen weapon that you can actually look around corners or fire from behind cover because you can sight your weapon through your your heads up display, if you will. Um, but the, the really neat thing about IVAS is the way we developed it. And we did it in three week sprints with a non-traditional hardware provider. So Microsoft and, my, and Microsoft is a government vendor, uh, but not necessarily for hardware other than possibly computers. Um, but three week sprints. So every three weeks, soldiers got with engineers and they touched the, the current con the current prototype. Um, and we started off with a commercial thing. We were just hanging sensors on and we got soldier feedback and the engineers went back and fixed things over three weeks. And then we did it again. Then we did it again. Then we did it again. And I said, soldier touch point three, three big soldier touch points and one to go. Uh, this one's a big one because this will be the first uh, military version of IVAS that we will put on soldiers head and we'll run a company. Matter of fact, the company is going through its paces right now in terms of company uh, 
operations, if you will, to include land nav, to include a movement to contact, to include all the things a company is going to have to do. And this is not a company of volunteers. This is a company out of the 82nd Airborne. And then we'll take that feedback and we'll go back and make more changes uh, before we actually get to fielding. So if we stay on schedule, if the funds are sufficient, we'll begin fielding this this fiscal year. And I remind everybody, I mean, just in 2017, we were in the courtyard with then Secretary Mattis, and it was just a gaming commercial solution when we made this commitment. Um, the precision strike missile, three test shots so far, all successful. Next year, we'll tie PRISM into project convergence, and we will execute a over 500 kilometer shot uh, with the PRISM missile. Uh, once again, that's about three or four years uh, from idea to getting that capability into the hands of soldiers. Um, hypersonic flight, most of you are tracking in March uh, in conjunction with the Navy, uh, launched a hypersonic missile. I'm not going to talk about from where or where it landed or range, but I would just say it was incredibly long distance. And we got some work to do because we missed, and you've heard the secretary say this, we missed by six inches, or it may have been seven, depending on who you talk to. Um, but incredibly successful and a new, a new capability, thanks to Neil Thoroughgood at, at RICTO, that's, that's coming to your army. Uh, unified network, and so in the past, we, you know, we kind of talked about networks and what we're, the network we're gonna have for the next 20 years, we're not doing that anymore. Um, we started with WinT as our baseline because we had invested billions of dollars in WinT, and then we're talking about cap capability sets. Could we fundamentally know that we can't keep up with technology and commercial industry in this space? And so every two years, we look at spinning in commercial capability that will increase our uh, the network, the resilience, the reliability, the anti-jam capability. The, the ability to do an automated, what we call a pace plan, so much like an iPhone or an Android picks the best signal, the ability for our network to do that and really just harden that network as best as we can and, and multiple channels to go through. And so we'll, we'll start fielding Cape Set 21 as it would sound in 21 and we're already looking at Cape Set 23 and later this, this FY we'll lock down Cape Set 23 uh, and begin to go into production so we can field in 23. One of the key components of the network has to be backwards compatibility uh, because it, the network's never going to be stable. Uh, what's in the network in terms of a material solution is never going to be stable. So backward compatibility, and I would add coalition comp compatibility is built in from the very beginning. Uh, that's one of the line of effort that we push. And then um, I'm trying to pick something else out here because I'm starting to run out of time and I'll just move on because once again, I could talk about this for hours, uh, to a thing you're also going to hear from Colonel Len Rosenoff, uh, who runs my Army Applications Lab, about a thing called Spartan Fire Faster. We just did the award. It's, a, it's an SIBR, SIBR uh, program. And the thing that's unique about this is the incredible cooperation between the program manager the cross-functional team director, in this case, Brigadier General John Rafferty and Colonel Len Rosenoff, the Army Applications Lab director. Um, and it's all about bridging the so-called valley of death. So how do you get from a 6-1 to 6-3 idea into a 6-4 prototype and into the hands of a PM? And I would tell you early buy-in from the problem owner, in this case, the PM, is the key to that. Um, and so through a pitch, um, the normal pitch you see a lot of people doing, uh, a quick award of, of, of pretty significant SB, SIBR dollars, um, and we're going to get it done in, and Len will probably correct me, it's less than 45 days, it may be 30 days, from announcement of award winner to money in the hands of these young startups and in some cases young entrepreneurs to help us think fundamentally different about how we do this. And the unique thing about this is we didn't start off with a requirement. We didn't even start off with saying how we want to solve the problem. The problem statement was basically, and it's, it was really centered around the, uh, the auto loader capability in a, in a howitzer, but we didn't, we didn't say we want to auto loader, you know, figure out how to build us an auto loader. We said, we want to fire faster. 
And that was that was a problem statement. Uh, we want you to help us figure out how we go from X amount of rounds per minute in a howitzer to Y amount of rounds a minute in a howitzer. And we don't care how you do it. Um, just help us figure out how to, how to fire faster in that platform. Um, and I am just about out of time. So last couple of things I'll, I'll mention, uh, university partnerships and robotics, hypersonic flight, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And then lastly, I told you I'd talk about talent. Um, we understand that we're going to have to look at talent differently in the future. A couple pilots that we're running right now. So at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where my AI task force, the Army's AI task force, soon to be the AI center is located. Um, we have two pilots running, uh, two years master's program uh, that would grant for data scientists and data engineering degrees. Uh, another program, it's a one-year program. I call them digital master gunners. The technical, technically the right name is AI technicians. So build the environment, maintain the environment, if you will. And then here recently in Austin, we've announced the startup of a software factory. Uh, first cohort is showing up now. We'll start the middle of January. And we've closed the application window for the second cohort, which will start in June. Uh, low numbers right now because of the pilot, 25 and, and 25, maybe 35 for the second pilot. But the interesting thing is, and the, the first pilot is, is just indicative, and it's the same thing for the second pilot. And I'll talk about both of them a little bit. First pilot, the only place we advertised was on our website. It took us all of three weeks to find 25 soldiers, current soldiers in uniform, that had that were interested and had the skill sets to do this and, and not any of them, maybe a couple, but I think none of them have a degree in coding or software development. Uh, these are all kids that grew up with this, that learned, picked this skill set up on their own, that do this in the barracks on the weekend or in their basement on the weekend. Um, and 25 of them will start this course in January and 11 of them were on their way out of the army. Uh, because the army was not fully utilizing that their their full skill set, um, and so PSC to major in the first cohort. Second cohort, we've been advertising for about two months now uh, through a variety of different means. We've got well over twenty thousand people interested, and when we lock down the application window, three hundred eighty six applications for twenty five slots. Uh, this time, PFC again to Lieutenant Colonel, uh, 80 different MOSs, um, 60 different installations across the Army, um, and all just incredibly excited. So I, I, I say that just to let you know that I'm convinced we have the talent. Now we got to figure out how to harness that talent, get it baseline, how to utilize that talent, where it needs to go first in low numbers. And then probably most importantly, what we need to do to retain that talent so that they're not hired by industry as soon as we get them trained up. Um, okay, I'll just end with this elephant in the room. You know, what if the top line uh, goes down for DOD? A lot of people would say when the top line goes down for DOD. I've been asked this before and my answer is all, always the same. It depends on how, how far down and for how long. And then it really comes down to priorities. Um, and the one thing I am most proud about our Army leadership through a change of the chief from General, McKilly, Mc, uh, General Milley to General McConville, no change in priorities and a change in Secretary of the Army from Secretary Esper to Secretary McCarthy, no change in priorities. And I don't think, matter of fact, I absolutely believe our priorities are not going to change no matter what happens in November and no matter what happens to DOD's top line. And why do I say that? Because they are grounded in operational scenarios. They have proven their utility in modeling and simulation, and they have proven their utility in modeling and simulation where both Indo-PACOM slash U.S. Army Pacific and UCOM slash U.S. Army Europe have participated. So we these, val these parties have been validated by operational commanders in operational settings using real world scenarios, um, not only current, but future scenarios. And so I, our priorities absolutely make sense in terms of what we think we will need to fight and win in the future. So I think we're on solid ground with our priorities. But just like everything else, it's gonna come down to priorities and tough choices. And we've made some tough choices in the past, so we, 
we know we can do it. And once again, how far and how long, there are more tough choices coming. So I'll just uh, stop right there because I actually think I'm over a little bit, which doesn't surprise me. Most of you should know the Army's redefined their priorities. Um, it was readiness, modernization, reform. And at AUSA here recently, the, the chief, and I think he's absolutely right, and the secretary uh, have reshifted our priorities to people, readiness, and modernization. Um, and, you know, just like any good organization, we got to do all three. Uh, but we absolutely understand that that people matter, winning matters, and we can't do the second two, the readiness or the modernization without great people. Um, so AFC is on board, uh, and that goes back to that talent management we talked about in terms of how we manage that, that digital talent and really take care of the workforce that we currently have. So with that, uh, thanks for your time today. I apologize for going a little long. Um, I appreciate the extra five minutes up front, I guess. Uh, and you've got a great panel coming up. I know uh, Secretary Murphy follows me, and I, I'm sure Secretary Murphy's absolutely amazed that I am where I am. Um, but uh, Secretary Murphy and I worked together for a short period of time when he was at building. Just a, a great man. And I mentioned Harry. Uh, and then you've got some, a great panel coming up with uh, Neil Thorogood, Ross Kaufman, and Len Rosenoff. So enjoy the conference. Um, look forward to next year when hopefully we can do this live. So thank you very much. General Murray, thank you so much. That was uh, outstanding. Uh, you apologize for going a little long. We could listen to you all day. Outstanding. <laughs> thank you, sir, so very much. Thanks for your service and certainly thanks for your time for being a part of our America's Future Series Joint Military Pitch Day. All right. Thank you. No, thank you, General. Thank you very much, General. No relation to him. His last name's Murray. Yeah. I'm Scott Murray. This is David Hamilton. But I tell you what, uh, he's this, a good one to be related to. Boy, does he have it on on uh, on target. Yeah. This is exactly why people wanted to be part of this, and it's to hear what he had to say. Yeah. Outstanding. Uh, this is exactly what the message is. This this is the information that the um, civilian world needs to hear to understand how this is working and how they could be involved and how they can plug in what's going on and ultimately his last point is the most important one which is that this is not a technological or innovation challenge this is a leadership challenge and i feel really good to have him at the helm so that, makes, that makes me very happy yeah. yeah absolutely well for those of you that are just joining us this is the america's future series day two of our joint military pitch day as i mentioned i'm scott murray this is david hamilton we're going to be here till uh later on this afternoon as we were yesterday a lot of great reviews from uh what took part or what took place yesterday. And if you weren't a part of it, uh, you missed out on a lot of great stuff, but you are here today. We're delighted to welcome you and certainly hope that uh, if your schedule permits, you'll stick around and, and join us because as the general just made note of, we've got some outstanding folks that are coming up to share just incredible information with each and every one of us. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Stay safe, stay tuned. David, I'll send it over to you.